welcome to Come Follow Me, Exodus 7 through 13 this day. I'm your instructor, Dr. D. Todd Harrison, as we continue to come unto Jesus Christ through the teachings of the Old Testament found in the Holy Bible. What a great year it's been as we continue to look and see how God has dealt with his prophets and with his servants from the beginning of the history of this earth and, and up until the present days as we continue now to and uh, looking now this year at the Old Testament, followed by next year the Old, the New Testament, and then we'll look at Latter Day uh, Scripture uh, after that, and the next uh, two years following that. We welcome all of you. We're glad you could be here today as you seek to come unto the Lord God to listen, to feel Him speak to your hearts and into your souls the things that you need to learn in your life at this present time through these uh, chapters in his holy word. We welcome you this day, and we will look today at this glorious prophet, the mighty prophet Moshe, or Moses, as he's known in the uh, in the English version of the Bible, Moshe. And uh, what a mighty prophet he was. We know that he was one of the seven great archangels, in other words, kind of the uh, presidency of the 70, the presidency of the gods type of thing fitting within Old Testament uh, uh, theology, uh, the uh, Elohim, the B'nai Ha Elohim. And so a mighty, mighty man of God, we know that he was far from perfect. Uh, we see that uh, Moses himself was a murderer, and yet he was uh, able to, to have God use him to rescue the Hebrew slaves from Egypt after 400 years of uh, slavery and afflictions in that uh, in that wilderness in that desert uh, country of Egypt and uh, we see him perform all kinds of mighty miracles and mighty wonders uh, you know on behalf of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and of that Lord and Savior Jesus Christ I testify as one of his witnesses that he lives today he rose from the dead he is our Lord, our King, our Savior, our Redeemer, our all. May the angels of heaven shout hallelujah and praise him in his holy temple in heaven night and day forever and ever and ever. Let's look today now at the, uh, at the uh, Exodus chapter 7. And let's look first at verse 1 through 9. He says, and Yahweh... It's the Hebrew for the Lord, capital letters in the English version, L-O-R-D, means Yahweh. He that, uh, he that causes to be or he that brings into existence. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, see, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet to Pharaoh. <laughs> what a great uh, verse of scripture. Uh, from this, we can see how the scriptures use the terminology of gods. Oftentimes, people are uncomfortable with this uh, plurality of gods, the Elohim being in the plural. Uh, but here uh, in the uh, Hebrew text is calling uh, Moses a god uh, to Pharaoh. Now, we know he's not the god or he's not, you know, our heavenly father and this type of things. But in his role. And in the way that he's going to act and interact on behalf of God with Pharaoh, he is though he is a God. Now, Joe Smith's a little bit uncomfortable with this, so he uh, changes it to, to just be prophet here, uh, which is uh, surprising because, you know, he liked the word gods and used gods in a lot of different uh, variety of contexts and to mean things that a little bit different than the normal traditional historical view. Of, of God, which then leads a lot of people who don't understand simple doctrines of the gospel to uh, accuse him of uh, teaching uh, some false doctrine. But, uh, you know, we see from the scriptures, it's not false doctrine. You would have thought he would actually like to keep it this way here. But uh, nevertheless, even though it, uh, you know, he moves it to prof here because he felt inspired by God to do so. The original Hebrew text does have gods, and that's the one I like right here, because he's going to become a god to Pharaoh, right? We're going to see him perform all kinds of mighty wonders on earth and in the and in the skies and, and in the seas and, and everything as though he were God on the earth as far as the Pharaoh is concerned. Okay, so let's look now here in uh, 
and Aaron shall be thy pro be thy prophet to Pharaoh. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. So, see, uh, the, we continue to see this throughout the scriptures, uh, from the Book of Mormon to the Doctrine and Covenants to the Old Testament to the New Testament, that prophets and apostles are to speak the words of God. They are not to uh, voice their own opinions. God has not called them to voice their own opinions. They are to speak on behalf of God that every word that should come forth from their mouth should be scripture, should be the will of the Lord and the power of God unto salvation. They are not to add their own personal opinions on top of that. And they are to speak all that God commands them, not part if God reveals to them to speak a word uh, and uh, give a revelation, uh, uh, give a prophecy to people, and they get scared and uh, little weak uh, humans uh, to, to, to tend to be at times and refuse to speak the all that God commands them. They are, you know, not fulfilling the role of a prophet or apostle. And so that's what he's saying here, that uh, Moses, as well as other prophets, should speak all that I should command them. Okay, and he says here, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he shall send the children of Israel out of his land. And in verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. We know that would not be correct uh, doctrine. God does not harden people's hearts. He gives them the free agency to choose whether they will harden their hearts or not. And that's why the JST translation here has, and Pharaoh will harden his heart, as I said unto thee. Now again, right? And that doesn't surprise God that Pharaoh hardens his heart here. God is is all knowing, right? He knows all things. He knows how his children will freely act in any situation, any circumstance he shall place them in. It's not a surprise to him. He's not surprised that Pharaoh hardens his heart here and that he has to give, give many miracles and signs before he'll finally release uh, the, uh, the, the, the Hebrew slaves. God knows that before time. Now, he still has his free agency, you know, whether he will release the Hebrew slaves early on the first miracle or, or not, right? But God already knows how he will act, given that he has free agency in the circumstances in which Pharaoh is placed. Okay, and he says, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt to great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. They're worshiping multiple gods, right? And they shall know that I am Yahweh. He doesn't even say I am God here, right? He just wants to have his name recognized that he, Yahweh, is the most powerful God over all their false gods, you know, he, he is Yahweh, right? Not even God. He doesn't even want him to know that he's God, right? He wants to know, be known by his name, Yahweh here. Very powerful, very, very powerful. He says, uh, when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring forth the children of Israel uh, from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as Yahweh commanded them, so did they. And Moses was 80 and Aaron was 83. And uh, again, here we get... Uh, uh, this uh, great wisdom and knowledge and uh, having prophets with uh, multiple years in, in their lives. Uh, they've experienced a lot of things in their lives. They have a lot of experience to, to uh, draw on. Uh, people in a lot of cultures throughout the world, uh, you know, uh, honor the elderly and, and have a tendency to more respect them than if Moses and Aaron came in as 20-year-old, uh, you know, youngsters here. So uh, he's 80 and he's 83. Just like today, we have uh, modern day uh, the prophets that are quite uh, elderly, you know, to, in their 90s, right? So, you know, that's what God has used to be there. His head prophets from time to time are elderly uh, and, and men, right? Uh, and there have been exceptions throughout time where he's called younger younger ones. But uh, throughout the history of the world, even in the days of Moses, he's calling elderly people who have a lot of years uh, of experience and wisdom that God's able to 
uh, dr draw upon and, and use in, uh, in uh, guiding his uh, people. Okay, and he says here, uh, and then Yahweh spake unto Moshe and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. So now, uh, as Jesus said, an adulterous generation seeketh for a sign. So what do we know about Pharaoh here? He's an adulterer. Whether he's actually committing adultery, which most likely <laughs> he is. Most of the ancient corrupt kings and the Pharaohs did, right? But he's at least an adulterer by heart, right? He, he's an adulterer. That's why he's seeking a sign. Then you shall say unto Aaron, take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Tanin here. Now, this is not Nefesh. There's the serpent that spoke to, you know, Eve in the Garden of Eden in the first part of, of Genesis. Uh, so a lot of people don't know exactly how, a lot of debates as to how to translate Tanin here. Uh, uh, probably the preference here would be crocodile right remember that uh, the crocodile uh, sobek is the egyptian god uh, from the nile uh, river and so it m makes more sense that that's what we're talking about here so he, he casts his rod down and becomes a, you know a crocodile uh, which would mean something to them you know representative of, of god right and moses and aaron went into pharaoh and they did so as the lord had commanded and aaron cast down his rod before pharaoh and before his servants and it became a Crocodile. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And as, and as a debate among the ancient Jewish historians as to uh, what exactly this means. And they'll continue to use through their enchantments they did this. Through their enchantment, enchantments they did this other miracle. So uh, some of the ancient Jewish historians thought that this meant they did not really turn a, a rod into a crocodile or a serpent or whatever it, it may be here, uh, but that it was just that, that through their illusion, through their magic, they made it appear to Pharaoh as though they did so, right? So through their enchantments, they may not have really done it. And they cast, in verse 12, for they cast down every man his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Now, Ancient uh, Jewish historians say that, that at this point in time, Aaron had taken back the uh, serpent here, the crocodile, and it became a, a rod, and the rod itself ate their uh, serpents. Uh, you know, it's even a greater uh, miracle uh, than what's on the surface here. It's not the serpent uh, doing so. It's the rod doing so, the rod here. And yet Pharaoh hardens his heart and does not hearken unto uh, Yahweh, as, as he had said. And so now the next thing comes here in verse uh, uh, 15. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning, lo, he goeth out into the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's bank, uh, river's brink, against thee come. And the rod which was turned into a serpent shalt thou take in thy hand. So Pharaoh's going out. Uh, the ancient uh, Jewish historians are not clear as to what, uh, what exactly, uh, what he's going out to do here. It's very clear that it all seem to be in agreement. He's going out to worship a false god, right? But whether he's worshiping the sun god, uh, Ra, for example, here, uh, keeping things simple and basic, uh, whether he's out here to worship Ra or whether he's worshiping Sobek, the uh, crocodile god of the Nile, uh, or, you know, but it, it, so we're not sure who he's worshiping here, but he's going out. He keeps going out to the river here to the Nile, which uh, was always, always kind of seen, seen as kind of a godly uh, source as well, this Nile, since their whole life's dependent on the, uh, the Nile River. And, uh, and so he's worshiping some kind of false god here. So uh, the, the Yahweh here sends uh, Moses there to meet him. And now they're going to do the great miracle of turning the rivers into blood, right? And it's very clear here that uh, he's going to turn the river into blood and all the fish are going to die, right? And it's important to know that because that signifies that it wasn't an illusion. It wasn't an enchantment that he's doing, uh, just like the Egyptian magicians here. He's not making the Nile and all the other rivers and waters appear to be blood, right? Or if that were the case, that he just made it appear to look like blood, 
then the fish would not have died, right? But the fact that he actually did turn it through the power of God into blood, that's how the fish were able to die. So then the enchantments of the Egyptians, and they somehow able to do a similar miracle, but notice the fish don't die, right? Now, uh, you know, so once again, trying to show here that the miracle Moses performed through God was more powerful because it was actually blood and it actually killed all the fish where the Egyptians perform, the Egyptian magicians perform this miracle and they uh, just get the, uh, just get the place, the, the waters to look like blood. Okay, so nevertheless, Pharaoh continues to harden his heart. He refuses to let the uh, Hebrew slaves go. Uh, the Lord uh, in uh, chapter 8 is going to give the plagues of frogs, lice, and flies uh, upon the earth. And uh, it continues to be that, uh, you know, uh, Pharaoh continues to harden his heart each time. You know, he continues to fight against the Lord. And at this point, he's still only offering, uh, God's only asking him to let the Hebrews go out for three days and, and sacrifice to him, right? He already knows, right, that if, if he has permanent release of the Hebrew slaves. Pharaoh is willing to let all of Egypt be destroyed. He's willing to let his whole family die off. He's willing to let all kinds of things. He will not let the Hebrew slaves go permanently, right? This is just, all of this is based on his hard heart that he will not let the Hebrews go sacrifice in the wilderness for three days. Now, God here is is, you know, and that's that way God is with the, the way he works with people, right? Some, he doesn't ask you to go do something nearly impossible that you're really not willing to do. He tests you in the small things. Will you let them go for three days rather than than permanent? And so what the, that's what this is all about. God is intending to release them permanently, but he's just asking Pharaoh for three days. Okay, so we get the uh, the frogs, and, uh, and they're everywhere, and, and then the lice, and... And then we get the flies, and Pharaoh continues to harden his heart on each of these. Uh, let's look at 25 through 27. And uh, and now he's, um, he's going to set up a, a trap. He's going to set up a trap for, for, for the, for the uh, Hebrews. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, Aaron and said, go, ye sac go, go ahead, go ahead and sacrifice to your God in the land, meaning the land of Goshen, the land of Goshen, where your where your family, where your families, the twelve tribes, uh, live. Right? Don't go out in the wilderness. I'm still not letting you do that. But go sacrifice in your in your own land here within uh, Egypt, where you're living, anyways. Right? Now, what's the trap here? Watch this. And Moses said, "It is not meat so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to Yahweh our God." Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their very own eyes? And will they not stone us? We will go three days journey to wilderness to sacrifice to Yahweh our God, and he shall as he shall command us, right? So the, the trap here is that you know the things that they're gonna sacrifice, the bull, right? You know, representative of their goddess Hathor, right? And the sheep are also uh, sacred animals to the Egyptians. So uh, they're going to they're going to go sacrifice sacred animals to to Yahweh. Well, if they sacri if the Egyptians see him sacrificing, uh, you know, uh, 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 the cows and and, and, and bulls and uh, you know the the Apis bull, all, you know, all the things that are representative of their gods and goddesses, uh, you know, uh, you know they're going to get mad and they're going to stone and kill the uh, the Hebrews. So this was a, a trap. This is not that he's having a weak moment here and letting the Hebrews go sacrifice. No, this is a trap. Okay, and then we'll look at uh, 29 through 32. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat Yahweh that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people tomorrow, but let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in, the, in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Just sacrifice, not permanent release. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart again at this time. Neither would he let the people go again. So 
He continues to do that. Now, God already knows that, right? God already knows he will continue to harden his heart. He knows how many miracles he's going to have to perform. He knows what the ultimate one one will be, which will finally allow, uh, you know, move Pharaoh to uh, release the, uh, the, the Hebrew slaves, right? But that's the way God is. But if you're just willing to even attempt to uh, uh, keep his commandments, he will, right away he will bless you. So Pharaoh's says, okay, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Therefore, God, you know, solves this current plague or pestilence, famine, uh, uh, destruction, uh, all these things uh, in our lives. But the idea is here that you don't become like Pharaoh and then immediately harden your heart again. And then he has to bring another destruction, another trial, another uh, tribulation, you know, into your lives. So hopefully we'll all learn a, a lesson from that. Okay, let's look at 9 here. In chapter 9, he's going to destroy the cattle of the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. So now he starts protecting the Hebrews and then destroying the Egyptians. So in the first couple of miracles, the, the uh, you know, uh, hurt his, you know, his own people, right? Uh, part of that was to give them affliction so that they would learn to trust more into, in, in God as he's going to bring him out of uh, uh, captivity, out of uh, bondage. Uh, but now he's going to start showing them and continuing to increase their faith, now above the afflictions that they that are suffering along with the Egyptians to where now they're being blessed by God to now increase their faith, where he's the, destroying the Egyptians. So that's in the cattle here, and he's destroying the Egyptian cattle, but he's not destroying the Hebrews. Let's look now at uh, uh, verse 11. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. So now the, now the boils break out, not among the, Isra uh, the um, Hebrews, but among the Egyptians. And the boil was upon the magicians and upon the Egyptians, so they couldn't even stand before Moses. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto him. Now again, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. As the Lord spoke to Moses, and the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Ko Amar Adonai, thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. And for I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. I am more powerful than any false god you worship. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power. We see this throughout the scriptures where God allows the kings of the earth to be the kings of the earth. There's no king of the earth, you know, in any country on the earth who God is not allowed to be in that situation. And he's allowing Pharaoh to be here so he could show through Pharaoh and the things that are happening to Pharaoh and the destructions that are coming upon Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his kingdom, the mighty power of God. So that my name may be declared throughout all the earth, not only being declared throughout all the earth in those days, but we're still being, we're still learning and studying the, this, the, these historical events thousands of years later. And yet, Pharaoh, you still exalt yourself against my people, and you will not let them go. Tomorrow I'm going to cause a, a very gr gr grievous hell, such as has not been. Now, this is going to strike him with utter terror. The ancient uh, Jewish historians say that this is the one that scared him the most. When he, when he gets this hail, such as not have been seen in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Send therefore now and gather the cattle. And we, they also get thunders, uh, uh, thunders and, and lightnings and all these things and it terrified Pharaoh. And then in 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hell in all the land of Egypt upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along the ground. That would have been terrifying. 
and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hell smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hell smote every herb of the field, break every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. So no hail in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, but the Egyptians are suffering from this. Now earlier he had said, and we probably should have looked at it, uh, he, 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 earlier it said, send therefore in verse 19, send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hell shall come upon them and they shall die. So again, God, even in his judgments, poured out upon the earth and upon the wicked and upon the nations. You know, he still is a God of love and a God of mercy. And he wants to bless his people. So he's even telling them, look, I'm planning to destroy anyone, any animal, any beast, any man, woman, child that's found in the field. So if you don't, don't want them to be destroyed, just bring them home, right? But they didn't do it. And so they had to suffer those uh, consequences. Okay, now let's look at uh, 27 through 31. He says, And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat Yahweh, for it is enough. There shall be, now look at that, entreat Yahweh, right? So he's starting to now believe that Yahweh exists, and that Yahweh is a powerful God, right? He's still worshiping his own God, so now it's just like he's including Yahweh among his gods, right? <laughs> You know, but this is at least the beginning of potential uh, true faith here as he's now starting to recognize there is a God here uh, uh, over the Israelite, over the Hebrew uh, people. Their God is real. Their God is powerful. So entreat him, uh, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings in hell, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I'm gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord and the true uh, order of prayer, and um, he says, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hell, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's, but as for thee and thy servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God, even Moses now, right, God knows it, and now Moses knows it, right, that he's still not going to fear Yahweh, right, and the flax and the barley was smitten, and the wheat it was, uh, and the rye were not spitten, spitten, for they were not growing up. Okay, and so now in 33, and Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto Yahweh, and the thunders and hell ceased, and the rain was not poured out upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more. Now his fear was gone. See, he had been scared of this, of this particular judgment. And hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. So now what do we get next? Chapter 10, we're going to get the locusts. And followed by a thick darkness uh, for three days. Let's look at 1 through 7. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. Now, again, we have to look at the JST translation. God does not harden people's hearts. It's they make that decision to harden their heart. For he hath hardened his heart in the hearts of his servants. Therefore, I will show these my signs before him. God is already upset enough when somebody decides to harden their heart. But when others become anti-God, anti-Jesus, uh, and anti-the church, and then try to lead others astray as well, then his judgments will really surely come upon them. Because now not only are they destroying their own salvation, but they're destroying other people spiritually as well. And thou mayest tell in verse 2, in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son. So the, God does these miracles always so that you will pass them on to your children and into your, unto your grandchildren. And, and as you bear testimony to your, your uh, descendants, uh, how mighty God has worked in your life. The signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. 
And Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of that which has escaped, <laughs> what's remaining. Your whole country is almost completely destroyed. These locusts will finish the job, right? Which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which grows for you out of the field. And they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. Well, that's powerful stuff here, right? Because in the ancient, um, um, you know, in the ancient cultures, uh, when they would leave Pharaoh, they just backed up from Pharaoh. You know, they didn't turn their back to Pharaoh. Here, Moses now is turning his back to Pharaoh. That's even adding, adding insult to injury here. That's going to really enrage him. So that's why in verse 7, and Pharaoh's servants said to them, How long should his men be a snare unto us? They are very angry, very upset. How dare Moses turn his back to me and yeah, to, to you, Pharaoh? Let the men go that they may serve Yahweh their God. Knowest thou not that Egypt is destroyed? Have you not realized our whole country has been destroyed because of this guy? <clears throat> and in verse 8, And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go. Serve Yahweh your God, but who are they that shall go? And so now he's still trying to, he's still worried about letting people out of his sight even for three days, right? Let's look at 16 through 23. Uh, then, uh, and so now we get the three days of uh, darkness and they can't see anything. And 16, uh, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. And he said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Keep saying your God, right? Don't notice that. He keeps saying your God. He recognizes that Yahweh is a real God, that Yahweh is powerful, but he's still refusing, refusing to worship him, you know. Uh, you know, a true son of perdition, right? Uh, uh, he would kill He would kill Jesus if, if uh, Jesus had come in among his kingdom. And said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust on all the coast of Egypt, but the Lord in, uh, in verse 20, JST, but Pharaoh hardened his heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And Yahweh said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Not only will they not see, they will feel this darkness. What a horrible situation that would be, right? And so it is in, in our own lives and in the lives of many uh, you know, on the earth today, right? Is that they harden their hearts against God, reject him from their lives. They can be engulfed with this utter darkness, right? That they can feel. They know they can feel that God's spirit has departed from them. They know they're not happy in their lives because wickedness never was happiness. And so it's a horrible situation to be in. And for those, you know, that are in that, that's why we need to and implore them and to, you know, and to let them know that there is a better way to live your lives, that you can reject that utter darkness from your lives that you can feel and come back into the light, the light of joy and, and peace and tranquility and, and happiness. And, uh, and so then in 22, he says, the Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. There was a thick darkness on the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another. Neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings, right? The righteous have light in their dwelling. The wicked have utter darkness that they cannot see spiritually and that they feel spiritually. Okay, so now we look at uh, chapter 11 and look at 1 through 8. 
And Yahweh said unto Moses, yet will I bring one plague more. I say, he knows, right? He knows. We don't surprise God. He knows everything, right? He knows how we will use our free agency and, and what choices we will make in every circumstance in which he will place us, right? But because he's a God of justice, he cannot prejudge us without us proving to ourselves how we will act, whether we will choose him or not, whether we will choose to keep the commandments or not. That's what life is about. We didn't come here to the earth to, to somehow show God whether we're going to keep his commandments or not. He knows that. In theory, he could judge us already and judge us based on what we would have chosen in every circumstance in which he places us. But that would not be just, right? He needs to be just and fair by allowing us to prove to ourselves is the way that we need to read Abraham chapter 3. We prove to ourselves if we will keep God's commandments or not. God already knows. So God already knew Pharaoh was going to harden his heart and not let the people go on any of those prior ones. Now he knows with this last plague, he will let the people go. And upon Egypt afterwards, he will let you go, hence. It's his free agency. He can choose not to, but God already knows through his, his uh, all-knowing that he will use his free agency to let the people go. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out, hence, altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his thing. Here we go, right? God of justice again here, right? They've been in slavery for 400 years. They're owed great wages by the people of Egypt, and God will make sure they get paid, right? Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor, right? And every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. Later we'll see it's also uh, clothing. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, right? He moved the, upon their hearts to let them take all their stuff. More, moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt. So even they recognized that this Moses is a mighty, uh, powerful man who's God, God is with him. In the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people, Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, Ko Amar Adonai, about midnight will I go out in the midst of Egypt. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more again. But against any of the children of Israel shall, shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the righteous and the wicked, the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. This is a righteous anger. This is the type of righteous anger that Jesus used when he overthrew the tables and the money changers that were selling in his house in the holy temple when Jesus was living there in the, during the last week of his ministry. Okay, so that's uh, chapter 11. Let's look now at chapter 12 and we'll look first at verse 3. Uh, he says here, uh, Speak ye unto the, all the congregation of Israel, uh, saying, uh, now, now, first of all, here it's it has God often will do when He brings the people out of bondage, out of slavery, so forth, as kind of a restart of the creation of the world, right? A, a, a new time, a beginning of a time here, right? So now th this uh, this release from Egyptian slavery, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months, right? It shall be the first month of the year to you. As commemoration that I, uh, you know, rescued you from this bondage. Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And who is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Jesus Christ, right? So the lamb is representative of Jesus Christ. And just as they will be saved by the blood of the lamb, 
they are saved by the blood of the Lamb of God, yea, even Jesus Christ. In verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. So a lamb without blemish, just like Jesus Christ. And ye shall keep it up. Let's see. Let's look at 6 or 7. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. Spend some time with it. Get to know this lamb. Have some kind of feelings attached to it so when you sacrifice it, it is a sacrifice. It's not just some animal you found off the street, but that you have some tender feelings towards it as one of yours, as maybe even a pet type of thing here to, to that you're making a sacrifice. And you shall and the whole assembly of congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts of the door and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. 12 through 14. For I, the Lord God, will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood of the lamb, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. And the Jews have continued to do that even to today. This is the Passover celebration that they that they have each year. And what a great symbolic thing this is, that as God saw the blood of the Lamb, he saved that household. And so it is with us today. If we just would take upon ourselves and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior as we repent, as we come unto him with full purpose of heart, being willing to, to listen to him and to follow all of his commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, as he said. You are then entitled to that blood of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and which when the angels of God, the angels of destruction that will come forth in the book of Revelation in the latter days when they can see that you are saved by the blood of the Lamb and that you lay claim upon the blood that was shed for you by the Lord Jesus Christ, they will, the angel of destruction will pass over you and will not destroy you. 29 through 33. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, and to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, which could have been avoided if they had just listened to the Lord. And so it is with people who suffer due to their wickedness. They could have been all avoided. It could have all been avoided, every, one, every bit of it, if you had just humbled yourself before the Lord. For there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go and serve Yahweh as you have said. And also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> it's just always about him, right? Always, always about Pharaoh. It's always about his selfish, very selfishness coming out here on the great display here. <laughs> he wants to be blessed. Well, isn't that great? And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people, and they might send them out of the land in a hurry. For they said, we all be dead men if these people don't get out of here. 35 through 37. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moshe. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. God of justice is making sure his people get repaid for the 400 years of the injustices that came upon them. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. They took all their good stuff. 
And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot that were man besides children. So 600,000 men. We figured up that that's uh, 18 and above. We figured up most of them probably married. And so that's probably about 1.2 million now. And then if you figure maybe almost two kids per average. And so a lot of people, a lot of scholars will say there's about 2 million, right? 2 million now that are coming out here. 46 through 47, we get a prophecy of uh, Jesus. In one house shall it be eaten. Uh, talking about eating this, uh, you know, eating the lamb here. Uh, in one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. Just as Jesus, it was also foretold later on in the book of Psalms, for example, that not a bone of his body would be broken. And uh, that's why uh, when he, he dies upon the cross, the soldier takes the spear and puts it in his side and, and doesn't try to break his legs as they would break the legs of the people uh, that were uh, uh, and, uh, undergoing crucifixion so that they would hurry and, and um, uh, you know, and uh, basically uh, um, collapse, uh, not be able to breathe anymore as they can't push up on those legs to catch breath. And so they're able to die quicker as they break their legs. But when they come to Jesus, he's already dead. So they pierce his uh, side and they don't break his legs. And fulfillment of this prophecy that his bones should not be broken. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. 50 through 51. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Okay, now we'll look over here in chapter 13, and this will be verse 17 through 22. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, less peradventure, the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. So their faith is still undergoing, right? They've gone through all these great signs and wonders. Uh, they at first were afflicted along with the Egyptians. Uh, then they went through being blessed in each of the uh, uh, judgments as God poured them out while they saw the Egyptians uh, get crushed under those. But they still don't have enough uh, enough faith to be able to fight these inhabitants of the uh, you know of, of Canaan at, at this time. So it's not time yet. God's got to go take them for forty years to continue to perform signs and wonders, to continue to help boost up the faith of the people, so that they can go in and fight these great battles against many of these descendants. That that you know whether whether really historical or not, these are all the descendants of these giants, the Nephilim. You know, and these are is they're going to say later on in Numbers uh, when the twelve uh, when the, the twelve uh, spies go in there and take a look at these uh, cities that we appeared as grasshoppers in their sight. These are all these. Uh, so, and so according to the historical tradition here, at least, you know, they're about to face giants, right? They're about to face the descendants, the Nephilim, the descendants uh, for the uh, sons of God. The um, uh, Angeloi Theo uh, in the Greek Septuagint, the angels of God who came down in Genesis 6 had uh, sexual relations with the children, of, uh, with the woman, uh, the daughters of man, and produced the giants in the land. These are then the uh, descendants of the giants that they're about to go face. And so God says, you're not ready yet. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. You know, you had a hard time. We just had a hard enough time getting you out of, uh, uh, out of uh, Egypt and believing in me. To even be rescued from slavery, and we we're gonna have to spend the next forty years to continue to boost your faith and confidence before we go take on the giants in your life, you know. And that's the way God is, right? He works with us in the small things of life, the small trials, the small tribulations before He gets us before He gives us the great the giants in our life. Okay, so that unless they see the war and they just return to Egypt, thinking that that's easier. And, and uh, to be under Egyptian bondage than to have to face these uh, giants. 
But God led the people about through the way in the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Remember, Joseph had prophesied that they were going to come into uh, uh, to Egyptian bondage, but that the day would come in which they would be released, then bring my bones into to be buried with my fathers. Right? So they took the bones of Joseph, uh, Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and he should carry up my bones hence with you. So they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness, and Yahweh went before them by day and a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night and a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, of course, our uh, ufologists love these kinds of uh, verses as to what exactly is this thing they're describing as a cloud, which is uh, flying around in space and leading the people everywhere and, and, and they're marching and their journeys uh, through the wilderness. And what is this uh, uh, the pillar of fire? But uh, whether, you know, whatever it is, right, uh, you know, that's not the important thing here. It's not the important thing whether this is some sort of alien ship or you know, what, you know what this cloud is that's always moving around and always taking the people up to heaven and flying off and all that. That's not the important thing here. The important thing here in the scriptures, and we should always look at the important things here rather than speculation, right? So the important thing here is that this cloud is in this pillar of fire is representative of the presence of God. That as you do your best to honor God, to accept him into your lives, to do your best to keep his commandments as he, has, as, as he has commanded you, then he will be with you. And that's the represent, that's what this represents here, that he was with these people, you know, as, as though he were there with the cloud of uh, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He will not leave you. The presence of the Holy Ghost can always be yours day and night as you do your best to keep his uh, commandments and come unto him. And what a glorious thing that is to know that he will be with you day and night. And uh, so we extend that invitation for those of you who are not yet members of his church to, to come forward and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Exercise faith in him. Repent of your sins and he will forgive you. You can become a baptized member of his church and kingdom upon the earth through the waters of baptism by those who hold the priesthood and authority of God. You can then feel the Holy Ghost speak to your soul as you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He can be thy your constant companion, a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night as you walk through the rest of your lives here upon the uh, planet earth and go through the trials and tribulations of 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 the uh, of, of earth of, of the existence of human uh, existence uh, he can be with you in those trials and tribulations for those you have found inactivity and are in that darkness that they mentioned earlier we welcome you to come back come out of that darkness come unto the light come unto your land of goshen where they had light while there was darkness in the rest of Egypt for those three days. Come unto the light. Come back to the church. Let God bless you with that light once again, with that joy, with that happiness that you no longer have in your life, but that can be yours if you just come back and do the simple things that, you know, that God has asked you to do and just show forth from your hearts your, your love of God and your uh, willingness to accept him and to uh, walk in his ways to the best of your ability. And then his grace will come in and take care of the rest and uh, save you from spiritual destruction, save you from spiritual um, uh, um, uh, death, from the sp spiritual darkness, and, and free you into the light of his love. We testify of these things. We testify of, of God, our eternal Heavenly Father, that he indeed lives. He, he exists in the heavens. He is your Father. He's the Father of your spirit. There's no greater joy and happiness that comes to him than to bless his children as they humbly come before him. I testify of his mighty Son, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as one of his witnesses that he lives today. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He got up out of that grave on that third day, 
He showed himself to his apostles and prophets and other holy men throughout the history of the world so that they could go forth and be witnesses to the world that he lives today. We testify of him. We testify of his love and his mercy and his justice. We testify of the restoration of the gospel in these latter days that his kingdom his church is once again upon the earth. It continues to grow day after day. We ourselves in this community have continued to see people every single day come unto the Lord, come unto the missionaries of the church to become members of his church and kingdom upon the earth as it continues to grow and spread and to fill the, all, the whole earth as the prophets have testified and prophesied of such a great event in preparation for the fulfillment of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming soon to reign personally upon this earth for 1,000 years as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we shout hallelujah and praise the Lord. We testify these things. We pray for you every day that God will pour out his choices blessings upon you, that you will have food to eat and shelter to sleep under, and that he will find and show his great power in your lives, that you can always see how he mightily moves upon you and upon those who you love. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.